So I have to tell you, it's, it's with the great, great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Mike Edson, who's a dear friend and the Smithsonian Institution's Director of Web and New Media Strategy. Uh, his achievements are somewhat legendary. Uh, he developed the Smithsonian Commons concept. He uh, helped create the Smithsonian's first blog, Eye Level. Uh, and the first alternative reality game to take place in a museum, Ghosts of a Chance. Uh, I first met Michael uh, at an O'Reilly Foo Camp uh, about five years ago. Uh, he was a tech titan 2011 and a person to watch by Washington Magazine. Michael is a wonderful, wonderful guy and he has an unbelievably thick skin. And he's got an unbelievably thick skin because he knows he's right. And by the time he's finished tonight, uh, you will know that he's right and we're right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Edson. Well, thank you. And thank you, Will. And it's one of the great honors of my life, pleasures of my life, to be here with you and all your colleagues uh, opening up this incredible facility. So thanks for having me. Yeah. And you're right. I think we are right. And I'm going to say a lot of things in the next you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes that many of you have thought of before. Uh, a lot of you could probably stand on this stage and give this speech. Um, maybe I'll be able to say something you've thought of in a way that you hadn't thought of before. Or maybe I'll just help give you confidence that you are right, so you can go and stand on two feet in your own organizations and try and make the right thing happen. So um, I'm going to call an audible. Sorry, sorry, mate. Uh, uh, American football term for, for changing the plan. Instead of going straight into my talk, I'm going to start with a poem. We're all good humanists here. <laughs> and uh, this is a poem I wrote uh, as an Ignite talk in November. Uh, and it's called Jack the Museum. In the age of sail, we once were rooted. For 5,000 years, it constituted a world-shaping, epoch-making, record-breaking human being technology. This cannot be disputed. From the time of the pharaohs to the first steamboats, if you wanted to move some, gum, if you wanted to move some goods, some goats, send a scientific treatise about the sexual life of moats, fight a war against a foreign nation, take your kids on a round-the-world vacation, to move anything across the seas, your only hope was for a sail upon a boat upon the breeze. Only a fool would row, could bear to go that slow if they were in the know. Now, don't get me wrong. I imagine a case where a captain of reason could, without treason, reason rowing over breezing. I sometimes prefer a book in my hands to bits on a screen. It seems a good book may help my mind dream. And the slow, dirty gravel of the path less traveled, seems not to unravel the work of the travel, but gives a sense of joy to a boy or a girl with nowhere to go and time to get gone. But when the task that's at hand, like yours, is so grand, and the mission you're dishing has frisson, I mean, when you're jizzing, why row? Why bow low? You must stand, because today, here's our planet a hot packed piece of granite. World's on fire and we fan it? It's in trouble? We must jam it. We must man and woman it, not spam it with old tools that waste time, lame deeds that don't rhyme. Why wield a small hammer when you can jammer with a rammer? Why have a museum so you can see them, be them, getting foolish pride from taking small strides? Your inside museum guides giving tiny little rides through hoity-toity halls of art-filled walls and empty spaces filled with cases telling stories about the evolution of the races while the masses, the brilliant masses, all the classes wait outside. That's not a museum. That's a mausoleum. Now, I do love art. It fills the cart in the quickie mart of my happy heart. The coffee table babble ain't no fable. Dance and music keep me stable. To a soul beyond the pale, there's nothing finer than a science center model whale. <laughs> but if the whale don't scale, it's a planetary fail. We must scale. We can scale. 
We can move new ideas across the seas. It's the age of scale. Because it's not just a rumor that the consumer ain't no dumb boomer with no hands, heart, or sense of humor. She's a smart, caring soul. She's got friends. They can roll a trillion hours a year of civic action surplus on your ass. Shirky told me this is so. Take it. Go. No longer passive. Network voices now are massive. Network action makes old school broadcast reaction a distraction to this powerful new faction. Six billion people connected on the web. They'll tag your bits, hit your hits, grind your grits, pop your zits, give you fits, and take you to the Ritz. Solve your problems, make them theirs. Take away a thousand planetary cares. Cure your ulcer, hack your culture. Your museum should be theirs for the taking. You exist to maximize their making. Be assured that old boy taboos, they are breaking. A fine new recipe they're delighted to be baking. They are insane in the brain with the freedom and power of creative commons in the public domain. Remix in a fresh refrain with their friends, a new zooniverse, a new universe. It's the opposite of holding still or moving in reverse. It's perverse how they rehearse the inverse of the ancient 20th century manager's chapter and verse about who has a say, who does the work, and who just has to walk along silent behind a corporate content hearse. Flickr, it reached nine billion culture richer pictures. Open street maps and Ushahidi, and if my grandma could only see me, use 20 million CC0 records in Europeana to see, be, and make a vibrant culture like a cultural scientific new media data mixer mulcher, a grower, reader, seeder, super dynamic knowledge breeder beater who brings good things to Wikipedia. That wiki really loves to show the people what they love to know about the Himalayan snow, Madonna's brand new bow, Homer Simpson's dough. Where else are you gonna get that, bro? A museum? I don't think so. So, Jack the museum. We really need to make it scale, make it sail, so the culture continues to feed you. Do it now. Don't waste time working back in stagnant, small scale, small vision times. Do the museum. Thank you. So now moving on to the other side of the brain, let's see where this goes, the age of scale. I've been thinking a lot recently about scope, scale, and speed. Scope is what we choose to work on. Uh, scale is how big that work is. And speed is the pace at which we move. And I think that the world has changed exactly, constitutionally, fundamentally, in exactly these three dimensions, scope, scale, and speed. But most glams, haven't noticed. Most organizations haven't noticed. And this makes it impossible to fulfill our missions in any way that does justice to the scope, scale, and speed of the challenges we face now. At a time of withering, withering, I agonized over that choice of word, withering human challenges. And I think the problem is that most of our organizations forged our dreams in a simpler time. When success meant having big collections, having big buildings, and having good staff. But now, and it's not hyperbole, billions of people can engage and contribute. And outcomes that you couldn't even conceive of coming to work in the morning have become routine. And these new tools, new dimensions of scope, scale, and speed suggest, and that's a very gentle word, they demand, I think, a new approach to what we think of as the mission. At exactly a point when the mission of institutions like ours, organizations like ours, your work, is frankly a matter of survival. So I think we need new dreams. We need to reforge the dreams we have. My dreams go to 11.
This is a top to a, you know, what we use on stage, but it's very, very special because if you can see, yeah, the numbers all go to eleven. Look, right across the board, oh. eleven, oh, eleven, and most of eleven, the and then amps go up to ten. Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? <laughs> it's not ten. You see, most most blokes, you know, be playing at ten. You're on ten here, all the way up, all the way up, yeah. all the way up. You're on ten on your guitar. Where can you go from there? Where? I don't know. Nowhere. Exactly. What we do is, if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to eleven. Eleven. Exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make ten louder and make ten be the top number and make that a little louder? <laughs> These go to eleven. <laughs> And my worry is that, that museums, that glams, as we think of them, as we execute the art of doing them, are a dial that only goes to five. That's my worry. That's my worry for all of us. And, and I think you can tell a lot about somebody's dreams by what they choose to measure and what they measure with. So let's make some graphs. Actually, first, here is uh, a picture of the Chandra X-ray telescope, one of the Smithsonian's many amazing jobs just to fly satellites in outer space for NASA. We do it on contract. And uh, the Chandra X-ray telescope's job is to take pictures of the beginning of the universe, to see as far back into time as possible. And I talked to a Smithsonian project astrophysicist last year, and he told me they won't even consider a new project unless it returns a 10 times improvement from the last project. They, it won't even, they just won't even consider it. 10 times improvement. And with every 10 times improvement, what do you get? You can see 10 times farther back to the beginning of time. That matters. Scale matters. Uh, this is a simulation. The small box is the old instrument, and that's a 10 times improvement. That matters. So now, let's make some graphs. Uh, X and Y coordinate system. I know you're all are humanists. So am I. <laughs> Don't be scared. We'll get through this together. X, Y coordinate system. Every horizontal line is a difference of 10 million human beings. And every tick mark along the bottom is one year from 1978 to 2011, 33 years. Um, that's a graph of annual attendance at the USA's National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC across 33 years. Simplify that, and it's negative 1% growth in attendance at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, over 33 years, negative 1% growth rate. Um, and to drive the point home, above the line is people who don't visit the NGA, and below the line is people who do. And even that's a simplification of what is obviously a very complex story. But um, there's how you feel about this really depends on, A, what you think the mission of the National Gallery of Art is, and B, how you think about scale. Right? But there's a business saying, there's a lot of room at the top. Okay? There's a lot of room at the top. And I think about that project astrophysicist. We won't even consider a new project unless it returns a 10 times improvement over the last one. So here's hypothetical project X. It starts at the same visitation as the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 1978. But every year it adds 10%, not even 10 times. 10% from the year before just grows a little bit. A lot of businesses really are required to grow. Their shareholders would throw out the CEO and board of directors if they didn't grow a measly 10% every year. So let's just see what happens. Well, you get a, an incredible curve like that, certainly incredible compared to National Gallery of Art attendance. You have to zoom out a bit just to see the shape of the curve. So let's adjust the vertical scale. Zoom out to 500 million. Now each horizontal line represents 100 million human beings. And you can see the shape of that 10% improvement. Um, after 33 years, you get 102 million more visitors a year than the National Gallery of Art. Amazing. Let's compare it to Wikipedia unique visits. That's way up there, isn't it? Uh, let's adjust the vertical scale so we can really see what's going on again. So we're going to zoom out so that each horizontal line is a difference of a billion human beings, a seventh of humanity. And you see where Wikipedia unique visits is on the graph now. But I made a mistake. That's not Wikipedia unique visits a year. That's Wikipedia unique visits a month. 
So we need to correct that data, basically normalize it. Now, there we go. <laughs> That's a graph of internet users. 34% of the world's population is now online, or it was when I put the data for this talk together a few months ago. Uh, 2.4 billion internet users. 2.4 billion people with reliable internet access. 4.6 million National Gallery of Art visitors. That's a 2.395 billion person difference every year. And the thing is, when the National Gallery of Art or any institution sat down to, to write its charter or its strategic plan or its work plan 33 years ago, it couldn't even have had the thought of reaching, reaching, passively reaching that audience, let alone engaging them as collaborators, contributors, true participants. You just couldn't form the thought in your head, parking your car in the morning or getting on the bus. Oh yeah, I can work with 2.4 billion people today. But now, you can. American broadcast industry was ecstatic over the viewership for the 2012 Super Bowl. No, we're in 2013 now. 2013 Super Bowl. 108.4 million viewers. Woohoo, that's great. Um, Gangnam Style, last time I checked, had 1.3 <laughs> billion views, and it keeps growing. And actually, I did check this this morning. It's at 1.6 billion. So from the time I made this slide to today, we've had 300 million more views of Gangnam Style. And that's old news, right? We've moved on to something else. Um, 1.3 billion views of Gangnam Style, and it keeps growing. Um, and one of the backstories of Gangnam Style is that uh, Tsai earned $8 million in passive advertising income through YouTube, mostly because he turned his back on copyright infringements, right? Every football team, every school, every military unit in the world did a Gangnam Style ripoff that Tsai and his record company could have prosecuted them for, but they chose to turn their back on those infringements in order to get a greater audience. Uh, for the product. Here's another great example of openness or permissiveness leveraging enormous increases in scale. And I owe a debt of gratitude to my colleague uh, Mreda Sanderhoff for finding this example. Um, this is uh, obviously the Monty Python gang who were incensed that their fans were basically ripping off their videos and posting them themselves to YouTube, posting their favorite clips. For three years, you YouTubers have been ripping us off, taking tens and thousands of our videos and dot, dot, dot. So what did Monty Python Incorporated decide to do? Did they decide to sue everybody? No. They posted their own copies of the videos in high res on YouTube for everyone to use for free. And as a result, they reaped a 23,000% increase in DVD sales. 23 thousand percent in DVD sales because they gave away their product for free. Scale. We're talking about scale here. TED reached its one billionth video view last year. One billion. And Chris Anderson has a terrific talk up on TED. Ted, uh, Chris is the founder uh, of TED, or sort of the regenerator of TED, How Web Video Powers Global Innovation. And he identifies a series of design patterns that are well worth noting if you're interested in scale. Uh, Chris says, there are just three things you need for this to kick into gear. You can think of them as three dials on a giant wheel. The first is you need a crowd. The bigger the crowd, the more potential innovators there are. Second, light the way he describes openness, transparency, visibility. You need to be able to see what the best and smartest people in your crowd are doing, are capable of. Oh, and how you, as a participant, will learn how you will be empowered to participate. That's a mind-blowing concept, because that is how you will learn how you will be empowered to participate. I've been thinking about that phrase for about six months now, and I still don't have my head wrapped completely around it, I, mainly because I don't think we often are interested in empowering people to participate, let alone showing them the pattern. And desire. Innovation's hard work. It's based on hundreds of hours of research practice. Absent desire, none of that's going to happen. He's describing the design pattern for scale. It also includes openness. Ted is very evangelical about a posture of openness leading to great scale. We've become a little obsessed with this idea of openness. We opened up our talks to the world, to the world, and suddenly there are millions of people out there helping spread our speakers' ideas, thereby making it easier for us to recruit and motivate the next generation 
of speakers. By opening up the translation program, thousands of volunteers have translated their talks into more than 70 languages, thereby tripling our viewership in non-English speaking countries. And then by giving away the TEDx brand, which when you think about it was an audacious and I thought sort of foolish thing to do, but by giving away the brand, formerly the most coveted and protected aspect of any organization, the brand, suddenly they have a thousand plus live experiments in the art of spreading ideas, the TEDx brand. And these organizers, they're seeing each other, they're learning from each other, we're learning for them, we're getting great talks back from them, the wheel is turning. I think one of the outshoots of the open brand philosophy is this really cool product, project, uh, TEDx in a box. The TED organizers realized there was a hunger to produce TED Talks in parts of the world where there's an electricity, there an, and no one has a spare cell phone, there isn't any IT infrastructure. So they worked with the design firm IDEO to engineer a little box that contains a little Pico projector that runs on D batteries, um, a couple of cell phones that come preloaded with hundreds of hours of TED Talks already, um, audio recording equipment, a little tripod, and a manual for how to do a TED Talk. And the results are really genuinely astonishing. They have seven or eight of these units that just get drop shipped between locations in the developing world. You almost can't talk about scale and openness without talking about Wikipedia. Wikipedia uh, is enjoying its 1.8 billionth edit to all the online Wikipedia projects. And I checked this again, the number is about 30 million higher now. It's about 8.7 billion edits at this point. You can bring up this page live on the web and it spins in almost real time and the single and 10 placeholder digits turn so fast you can't even really see them. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and I love this little example. This is kind of a, an example of an old approach to scale and a new approach to scale. This is the Smithsonian Institution's canonical collection information page for Spaceship One, the first privately financed spaceship to launch someone into outer space. Um, this contains uh, one photo, 291 words, and one hyperlink. The Wikipedia page contains 1,400 words, 128 hyperlinks, 15 images, 14 external references, 26 languages. It's been translated into 26 languages, all with a total of about 400 editors. You know, if Will came in to his office Monday morning and said, we're going to do a new project, and I want 400 editors on it, you'd throw them out the window, I guarantee you. But this just happens. It, it happens because of the way the platform is configured and because of the Wikipedia team's vision and understanding of scale and the web. Uh, I thought this was funny too in researching the talk. I was, I was wondering about the evolution of our attitudes towards Wikipedia. They've changed dramatically in GLAMS in the last few years. This is a quote from the former editor-in-chief of Encyclopedia Britannica in an article in The Economist in 2006. Somebody who reads Wikipedia is rather in the position of a visitor to a public restroom. It may be obviously dirty so that he knows to exercise great care, or it may seem fairly clean so that he may be lulled into a false sense of security. What he certainly does not know is who has used the facilities before him. You know, times, times have really changed. Times have really changed. Zooniverse is a great example. It's a, it's a platform that lets citizens participate in scientific research projects. Um, 792,780 people taking part in that project worldwide. It's now about 830,000. This is another project that attracts participants with dramatic speed to do real difficult science, science that could not happen without this scale of effort. Um, OpenStreetMaps is a, is a project that I love. Over 900,000 registered users have contributed 14 million edits and 1.6 billion locations. It's, a, it's an open map platform made by people like you for people like you. Very cool project. And of course, you got to talk about Kickstarter. In 2012, 2.2 million people from 177 countries pledged $319 million in change to support 18,000 new projects. Kickstarter is not a big organization. This is not about having hundreds or thousands of people on your staff. It's about understanding how to create value and scale and impact on the internet. In all kinds, I mean the spectrum of creative projects 
initiated, completed, funded through Kickstarter is breathtaking. I, I don't think even governments attempt this scale and diversity of projects. You can't, also you can't avoid talking about Europeana, Europe's cultural aggregator that distributes 20 million CC0 records from its 2,700 content providers now, uh, an astonishing, huge, rich network of content providers that they manage. And 20 million CC0 records is nothing to sneeze at. The public domain and open content is really at the foundation of Europeana's thinking about their role in society. Um, open courseware, MIT Open Courseware, first 10 years, 100 million people served. Next 10 years, their goal, a billion people served. That starts to be a scale of impact and participation that you can see on those graphs that we drew earlier. That starts to be truly web scale value creation. Um, and I'm plugging this in here because it's something I'm trying to learn more about. Uh, bricks and mortar museum construction in China. China is said to have built uh, opened one museum every five days for the last 15 years. A total of a thousand new museums between 2000 and 2015. I'm trying to chase down the, the bureaucrat who's responsible for that so I can really see the facts and understand what that means. But we think in this country, coming into work in the morning, that museums, libraries, archives will happen at a certain scale because that's how they've always happened but it doesn't have to be that way. And this is the existence proof of that. Um, open library. Uh, Brewster Kahle uh, is kind of a, a fascinating guy and a total lightning rod in the library world, but Brewster looks academic libraries, such as the one maintained by this lofty institution, looks them in the eye and says, the people who are supposed to be doing universal access to knowledge and are getting $12 billion a year to do it are not getting the job done. Open library is a library by users for users online. He says, without users, our shelves are empty. Library thing, uh, definitely a very granular, citizen-driven library project. 1.6 million members have cataloged 81 million books, done 96 million tags, 2.1 million reviews, 3.9 million comments, chats. Um, the one user in particular has cataloged 65,000 books, okay? You know, you, you wouldn't know in 1985 if you had walked into an office and said, you know, I bet we can get, I bet we can get 1.6 million books cataloged just by Joe and Schmo out there. You, you would again, Will would get thrown out of the office again. <laughs> Sorry, Will, but it happens. It happens every day at tremendous, tremendous scale. I love this user has written 35,000 thousand book reviews. Um, this user has added 144,000 tags. And uh, Tim Spaulding, the founder of Library, says, Library Thing says, and I love this, library is not an institutional thing. Anyone who has a large collection of books has a library. I would say that's true for archives and museums as well, without a doubt. Now, right about this moment when I'm giving this impassioned plea slash spiel, someone always says or has the thought, well, this is just for big institutions, right? This is just, it's, it's easy for the Smithsonian to be telling the you know, Iowa Historical Society about scale. And you know, we've got four employees, we're just, we're, just we're just fighting as hard as we can to keep ourselves above water. So is scale just for big organizations like yours? Absolutely, positively not. Um, Public.resource.org is an organization dedicated to uh, promoting the free distribution of government materials, free and open distribution of government materials. Um, Public.resource.org's YouTube stream of recycled government videos has had 20 million views on YouTube, 20 million views, another 20 million views through the Internet Archive. They distribute more video than all but three federal agencies and it's just one guy in his spare time and a couple volunteers doing the work. Federal agencies ship him UPS boxes filled with cassettes, VHS cassettes, anything, film. He rips them, puts them up online. Uh, another example, smart history, smart history, now part of the Khan Academy, 
Um, smart history was started by two art historians who were dismayed at the paucity of good art information online. And so they started recording podcasts and shooting quick videos with equipment. Um, they call themselves a free, not-for-profit, not multimedia web book designed as a dynamic, I'm not even going to read the rest of that. But they have, uh, to date, posted 512 videos, 247 essays, 6 million visits to the site, uh, viewed in 200 countries. And their tech budget is $700, plus two laptops, two old laptops. Uh, Beth and Stephen take great pains to assure me. They do this on a shoestring budget because they understand the content, they understand the audience, and they understand what they can do with cheap gear now. Um, Beth Harris, co-founder, says, as professors, we reach 200 students a semester. Last semester, smart history content reached 750,000 users online. That's scale. That's very impressive scale. But scale isn't just about great big global size numbers. There are special categories of scale that are really meaningful to anyone in a mission-driven organization. Um, Ethan Zuckerman at last year's Digital Media Learning Conference gave a very interesting talk that came, he, he, he rolled out this, this matrix, this quadrant of scale for civic engagement. And this is how it works. Um, in symbolic and thin, so when the output is largely symbolic and the, what's required of you as a participant is very lightweight, he calls that the slacktivism quadrant. I love that word. I've never heard that word before. But the slacktivism says, you know, that scales very quickly. Every, it's very easy to give a thumbs up to feed the African children on Facebook. But it doesn't really accomplish much. It's very, very symbolic. Uh, across from that is something that's thin and impactful, like voting. Voting is supposed to be thin. It's supposed to be easy. But there are a lot of structures, you might say business processes, set up around voting to ensure that it is extraordinarily impactful. Symbolic and thick might be the Occupy movement. Uh, largely symbolic. They're not, they're not writing legislation. They're not directly lobbying for political change. It's largely a symbolic movement, but it requires a great deal of the participants, a great deal of sweat equity, you might say. But when Hurricane Sandy hit, veterans of the Occupy movement turned into Occupy Sandy because they'd practiced in this thick but symbolic environment for so long. They were the most effective local relief group when Hurricane Sandy hit. Occupy Sandy is what Ethan proposes as the example of impactful and thick. And he says the paradox of this, this matrix is that things that are thin and symbolic scale very quickly, very easily. It's like lighting uh, kindling on fire, burns white hot, but it's hard to cook on. It doesn't, doesn't generate deep embers. Uh, my language, my, my butchered metaphor, not his. Um, things that are thick and impactful often involve, like today, people very close together, a lot of high touch activities, face to face, small groups. Those are the things that really, Ethan argues, change the world. Those are difficult to scale. I do think, I've been thinking about Ethan's talk for a few months now, and I do think there are some very good examples of, of things that are thick and impactful that can scale using the web in intelligent ways. I won't run, I'm not ready yet, maybe during Q&A, but stay tuned for that. Um, another kind of scale I want to call the Z axis. We had the X, Y axis of people and, and usage. Z axis uh, is the third dimension of scale coming out at you in three dimensions. And I think that's for emotional impact and depth of impact on individuals. Um, it scales not in quantity of individuals served, but in how deeply we as our organizations affect them and affect their lives. A good example I found is Shakespeare Behind Bars that enables prisoners, long-term prisoners, death row prisoners, to uh, participate in Shakespeare plays. Uh, an article about Shakespeare Behind Bars reports that inmates who have been involved in the program say they experience a profound personal growth through it. First, by recognizing the depths of their own emotions, then by connecting with fellow prisoners through the camaraderie of sharing a stage. Those benefits are hard to quantify, but they have a big effect on a number that isn't. Participants 
have drastically lowered recidivism rates to a low of 7%. Another question, if you're thinking about emotional impact and depth, is how well are you really serving the people you already meet at your doors? The Toronto Public Library started a project, actually they're uh, carrying on a project that was started in Copenhagen, I believe in the 70s, um, called the Human Library. You can go to the Toronto Public Library and check a person out. The Toronto Public Library held its first Human Library event at five branches on November 6th, attracting more than 200 users who checked out the likes of a police officer, a comedian, a sex worker turned club owner, a model, and a survivor of cancer, homelessness, and poverty. These are very, very, very human interactions using the platform of a very 20th, 19th, 18th century kind of institution to really reach people deeply in a new way. Um, and the last special kind of scale I found is something I'm calling zero to one, going from a total absence of something to just the mere presence of it constitutes its own kind of scale. Um, I've been rereading the book, uh, Leaving Microsoft to Save the World by John Wood. John Wood was a Microsoft executive in the high flying 90s. He was in charge of, I think, sales of some aspect in China. Took a backpacking trip in Nepal as a little break. Was taken on a tour of a school up in the mountains with um, 450 students at this school. He was proudly shown the library. And he looked around the library and he asked the question, where are the books? And he was told, oh, the books here are so valuable. Learning English in particular is so important to us, to the future of Nepal, that we keep the books locked up because we're afraid that the students will ruin them. But if you like, we'll go find the key for them. We'll, we'll show you the books. So they went, they ran, found the person who had the key, ran back, and they unlocked this creaky old cabinet. And there were four books. Uh, a Danielle Steele novel, <laughs> you know, one of those with Fabio on the cover, um, an Umberto Eco book in Italian, The Lonely Planet Backpacker's Guide to Mongolia, and I think as Wood himself says in the book, no library should be without Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> <laughs> that was their library. And they asked if, if someday uh, he might return with some books or send them some books. Uh, after some soul searching, he sent an email message. I think this is 1998. He had 100 people. Imagine a Microsoft executive only having 100 people in his email address book. Had 100 email addresses. He sent an email to everyone explaining the need, asking them to send to his father in Colorado any books they had laying around, any, any, any books, anything. The school made it very clear, just anything that works. Um, his father called uh, about three weeks later and said, you need to come home, there are 3,000 books in my garage. Um, Room to Read just gave away its 10 millionth book. It's built 12,000 libraries to house those books where there were none available, and it's built 3,200 schools to house the libraries where there were none available, mostly through the work of local chapters, donations, and a lot of sweat equity. Year after year, it's rated as one of the most efficient nonprofits in the US. It's a tremendous book. I lost track of the number of times I've wept on the train on the way to and from my job in the morning reading this book. But it's an area where someone has found a way to scale addressing a fundamental human need going from zero to one. It's a tremendous story. Um, and I love this mission. If any of you are working on mission statements or strategic plans uh, from the uh, New York Times Magazine or Sunday Review article, in 20 years, I'd like to have 100,000 libraries reaching 50 million kids. Our 50-year goal. How many of your organizations have a credible 50-year goal? This is a very credible goal. In 50 years, we'd like to reverse the notion that any child can be told, you were born in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so you will not get educated. That idea belongs on the scrap heap of human history. So this kind of impoverishment, zero to one, isn't just about poor kids in the developing world. This kind of cultural impoverishment exists everywhere, everywhere in America, and not just in slums, in the suburbs and the fancy part of town as well. Um, 
One in four Americans lacks emotional ties to anyone in their lives. One in four Americans. I've got all the citations for these. This is, very, this is not me making up fantasy numbers. Three in four Americans do not know their neighbors. One in five Americans did not read a book last year in any format, ebook, online, anything, audiobook. The UK lost more than 200 libraries in 2012. Uh, the playwright who wrote Billy Elliot, Lee Hall, uh, told the world, working men and women in the northeast of, of England have fought generation after generation for the right to read and grow intellectually, culturally, and socially, to be as civilized as anyone else. It's a heritage that took decades and decades to come to fruition, but which will be wiped out in a moment. You're not only about to make Philistines of yourselves, but Philistines of us all. This is happening now. And Caitlin Moran's article, Libraries, Cathedrals of Our Souls, in response to library cuts and threatened cuts in the UK. This is a picture of her library, the Warstones Library in uh, Wolverhampton, UK. Caitlin writes, everything I am is based on this ugly building on its lonely lawn, lit up during winter darkness, open in the slashing rain, which allowed a girl so poor she didn't even own a purse to come in twice a day and experience actual magic, traveling through time, making contact with the dead, Dorothy Parker, Stella Gibbons, Charlotte Bronte, Spike Milligan. A library in the middle of a community is a cross between an emergency exit, a life raft, and a festival. No new libraries will be built to replace them. These libraries will be lost forever. And in their place, we will have thousands more public spaces where you are simply the money in your pocket rather than the hunger in your heart. Kids, poor kids, will never know the fabulous benign quirk of self-esteem of walking into their library and thinking, I have read 60% of the books in here. I'm awesome. Libraries that stayed open during the blitz will be closed by budgets. A trillion small doors closing. That's really where we are. We love these institutions. I love these institutions. And we want them to be successful. We've built and maintained them at the bedrock of our society for thousands of years because we need them to be super successful. We need to put the tools of knowledge creation into more hands. We need to share the joy and meaning of artistic and cultural exploration with more citizens. We need to deepen engagement with the challenges that face our species and nurture the habits of a civil and sustainable society. I haven't found anyone who doesn't think we ought to do these things. <laughs> but the question is, can we do this job quickly enough and at big enough scale to make a substantial difference in the lives of individuals and the fate of our species? We tend to compare digital initiatives with the best museum visits by our best audiences on our best day. But we know that many museum visits are imperfect. Many library and archive experiences are imperfect. I'm often asked if scale matters, if these big numbers matter, is a billion TED, TED videos better than 2.4 million museum visits? Are they better? Well, not necessarily. But the vast difference in scale is evidence that something, and I've really toned this down, significant, something significant, rich in potential is going on. And there are, if we care about the mission, we care about the outcomes in society, there are more powerful ways of getting these jobs done than having rooms full of stuff. I'll leave you with this, these thoughts from Google founder Larry Page. Um, in an article, Early this year, Wired Magazine, Larry Page expects his employees to create products and services that are 10 times better than the competition. Not 10%, 1,000%, 10 times better. That means he isn't satisfied with discovering a couple of hidden efficiencies or tweaking code to achieve modest gains. 1,000% improvement requires rethinking problems entirely, exploring the edges of what's technically possible and having a lot more fun in the process. Well, that's, you know, that's wired for you. Um, we have, Page says, direct quote, we have all this money. 
we have all these people. Why aren't we doing more stuff? You may say that Apple only does a very, very small number of things, and that's working pretty well for them. You may say that museums, libraries, and archives only do a couple things well, and that's working pretty well for them. But I find that unsatisfying. I feel like there are all these opportunities in the world to use technology to make people's lives better. At Google, we're attacking maybe one-tenth of one percent of that space. And all the tech companies combined are only at like one percent. That means there's 99 percent virgin territory. There's a lot of room at the top. So don't get me wrong. I don't want less museum stuff. I don't want less library stuff. I don't want less one-to-one -one engagement. I want more of everything. I want it all. I want more glams. I want more visitors in those glams. I want to deepen engagement at them. I want more web with more participation and better outcomes. I think we can do it. I know we can do it based on seeing what everyone else is able to do using the basic physics of the web of scope, scale, and speed. Thank you. So go do it, Will. Uh, thank you, Mike, for that incomparable uh, call to arms. Uh